Hi, this is Mike Torsha, and welcome to Live Well and Thrive. I have a very special guest today, Johnny Roast Beef. <laughs> welcome to the show, Johnny. Glad to be here for you. Thank you're my friend. Thank no you. Problem. So Johnny, as you know, has had an incredible journey. And I actually want you to share with us, how did it all become uh, as an actor? I know, you know, years ago, you did so many different things and running restaurants stuff. But how did it evolve into you being this incredible actor? Well, uh, you know, I, I, I have to credit it to uh, living a long life so far thank God, and a rich life because I'm from East Harlem, New York. I'm from the city streets and, you know, uh, struggle my whole life because of money. You know, we never had money. We didn't know we were poor until later on in life when you look back. Like I tell people in the restaurant in Rayo's, you know, at eight years old, I was delivering groceries. And he said, why? I said, well, it's better to have 35 cents in your pocket than lint. <laughs> uh -huh. You know, so you know, so what happens is uh, the medium that show business is you present uh, yourself in the roles that you play. And to me, that's more interesting than having gone to Juilliard or, or having to read a book about acting or whatever. Um, the natural way of doing things is just be yourself, put yourself in the role, identify it with certain uh, 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 characteristics of what you're playing and incorporate it. And I've been very fortunate because I've been involved in some great projects with some great people that believed in me, even though I didn't know what they were believing in because I had no idea I had this talent. I really didn't. Uh, uh, in retrospect, I had my deli on Second Avenue. The guys used to come in and say, we're not only here for the great sandwiches and the coffee, we're here for the show. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't know what they were talking about. A and then, like I said, as you get older and you think about what happened, I, I happen to have a very, very good memory of a lot of things. I could almost remember the way I felt in certain times in my life, uh, very young. And looking back, that's the fulfilling part of it because it, it, it's like connecting the dots. And you say, wow, this is what they meant. I mean, I have kids that I went to grammar school with that I still stay in touch with you know, from, from the old neighborhood, you know, St. Anne's School on 10th Street. And when they heard that I was in the movies, they said, we're not surprised. I'm surprised. They weren't surprised. So you take, you, 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 you take yourself out of who you are. They see it. You don't because you're in here. So your training was actually living life in the streets of New York. Yes. So when you're around the, the wise guys and the people in the streets, you understand who they are, so you become that character on the screen because it was a natural transition, right? 100%, 100%, and wow. situations that arose all through the years of, you know, living in New York, uh, uh, being in business. Uh, I also, before I went into my own business, I worked uh, for Fortune 500 companies. I was in the street, suit and tie, selling uh, Miller High Life beer and Heineken, and you know, wow. I got married. I had three kids. I mean, I had a whole different life. Of uh, this thing of show business was nowhere a reality at the time, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, I, I, I end up in a, in, in a uh, separation and divorce, and uh, I started soul searching for something that was. I mean, spending fifteen hours in a deli and coming home to an empty house is is not too cool, you know. So you you get introspective and you start searching for something. Say, gee, well, you know, what am I going to do to make myself happy? But yet you still don't want to lose your relativity, you know. I'm the deli guy, you know. <laughs> so as it turned out, I got very very lucky. Um, because I, I, I went to a program, um, a school teacher that used to come in my store. She, she liked me. She wanted, you know, her way in was, is it Johnny, you're too angry. Yeah, 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 this, that, and the other thing. He said, we're doing the seminar. Come with me. And the eventuality is going to that seminar. I said, seminars for crazy people. I mean, this is the neighborhood mentality sure. that I had. I believe me it was like jet fuel that i burst out of that neighborhood mentality one an open mind that allowed all of this to be a reality and that's really what happened to me well that what type of seminar was it it was uh the old est 
S program, oh, and then yeah. it turned out to be, yeah. So she took me in, and I had to go on a weekend. And I, had, I think it was $600 at the time. And I said, are you crazy? And, and believe me, it, it was- it Changed just, your life, huh? Well, oh, it was eye-popping. Eye I mean, I, I, I it, was, it was incredible. It was incredible. So how long after that did you actually get your like first role in a movie? Um, Let's see, I think that was- maybe about a year, a year before, a year and a half before. And then I was involved. Uh, we did the little mini seminars within the seminar. We had groups and and I, 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 it, it was just amazing. I I, I had a group, I, I could remember one particular incident. We had a group to uh, our uh, objective they picked five people, the random people that were in the group, and you know, we, we don't really know each other. We, we just know each other from the seminar, and so we we had a pod, and we had to come up with a program. We had to come up with a a project. So the project was to clothe the homeless in New York. So as it turned out, I I have friends that own dry cleaners. I made one phone call. I had to get two vans to get the clothes out of these stores that people didn't pick up for like a year or two. And I, I mean, my deli, wow. my deli was full of clothes and then we would bring them down to the shelters and we could bring them down to the uh, places where people could come and take them, you know, they needed them. So it was successful. And, 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 and all these little, these little, uh, uh, advances that you make, you never believed that you would be this way. And it was easy. It was easy. I mean, I have so many connections without realizing they were connections until they became connections. Well, especially being in a deli too. And yeah, you know. Community. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that was one. And then, you know, I started dabbling with, uh, at one of the seminars, uh, they picked five people to make a speech about what the seminar was about. And, you, you, you know, it was for, for the following week, you invite your friends, invite anybody you want to come on a Thursday night uh, down at the Holiday Inn on 57th Street. So I invited a couple of friends of mine, and then they nominated me as one of the people. Now, I'm, I'm, I don't understand what was going on because these people were very well educated. They were very, they had dictation. They, 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 they had uh, command of the English language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I'm a street guy, you know, and <clears throat> they wanted me one of them. So at uh, at that particular seminar, I, it was amazing. I mean, the first guy got up and talking about how he came to New York and he was dyslectic and he was selling encyclopedias in the hills of Tennessee and then he wow. came to New York. I mean, there were amazing stories. I, I didn't have a story. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a guy with a deli in Harlem, you know what I mean? And and um, and then the girl well, girl got up and she said she always had a dream of leading a symphonic orchestra, and she ended up in Newark with a symphonic orchestra. I mean, it, this was like phenomenal, and I'm I, now I'm getting panicky because I said uh, in my head I, I don't know what I'm what did I accomplish really, and then they skipped the next two guys. I was the fifth guy sitting in the chair. They call me next, so totally. Out of, you know, and I just went up and, and I said, listen, I'm a guy from Harlem. I got a deli. I, I cut baloney for a living. I don't know what you want to hear from me. <laughs> and uh, at the end of, I don't know, maybe a 10, 15 minute speech, whatever I said, they went nuts to people. They went, oh my God, you know, you're in the wrong business. You belong in show business. So that was like the seed kind of planted. Ah. And then I investigated show business, and and then I had a friend that had the, his girlfriend wanted to set me up with her girlfriend, and she was a speech teacher in uh, the three of our studios in New York. So she says, Johnny, we went on a date. The girl wasn't for me, and I wasn't for her, but she loved the way I speak. She says, you don't even need anything with your speech. You are what you are. It's perfect. And she said, uh, I could set you up in the school. Okay. So I go down to the school for the interview, and <laughs> it was so funny that day. The guy says to me, uh, he says, so uh, what's your background? I said, uh, what do you mean, what's my background? What's your background? I said, this is a school. I'm supposed to ask you questions like that, not you asking me. He says, uh, uh, hold it right there. He went to get a copy of a commercial. 
And he says, here, I'll be back in 15 minutes. Just read it. Don't memorize it, this and that. They put me in there and make a long story short. The founder of the school, her name is Joan C. She come down. She says, Johnny, listen to me. She says, there's no tuition for you. You're not, this is not your class. You got to go. You're what we call a natural. You got to go to advanced class. So we can put you in there. And bingo, I go in advanced class. The last, the last class of 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 that session, the last class of session, they had. Um, an agent from Cunningham Escott the Peeney, commercial agent in New York, come down and audit the class. And we all had to do a commercial, you know. I did mine. She said, I want to see you after the class. So you go after the class. She says, Here's my card. Come down to my office tomorrow, Park Avenue. I'm signing you up. So here I am. I have no picture, no headshot, no union, no nothing. And I'm in with the second largest commercial agent in New York City. Cunningham has got the painting. Wow. And uh, and then at the same time, uh, Frankie Sr., resident piece from Rayos, says to me, he says, you want to be an actor like breaking my balls? And yeah. I says, no, nah, you know. He says, uh, you met Julia Taylor. I had met her down the bar like two years, a year before. You know, and she liked me, you know. He says, uh, go down to Julia Taylor's office. And go see, there's a woman there, Ellen Lewis. She's casting a movie, a wise guy movie. He's our friend Nick Pelleggi wrote the book. And I knew Nick because she used to come down the bar. He yeah. Come down right I went down there and Ellen loved me. She, she loved the way I speak, the whole bit. And uh, she brought Marty down to Rayo's, not knowing I hang out there. I live up the block. I had the apartment, you know. <laughs> so she comes down there with Marty Scorsese and she sees me at the bar. She goes, Johnny. What are you doing here? I said, What am I doing here? What are you doing here? I live up the street. I said, she, and and I ended up meeting Marty with Nick Pelleggi down the bar. And he called me to read for him down in Warner Center and Rockefeller Center. And I get a part in a movie. Wow. Wh which one was that? Goodfellas. Oh, wow. That was a great role. You're yeah, fantastic. That was it. I mean, that was that was the calling card. So I mean, that if that was... wasn't for that, who knows if I would have progressed in this business. It's so difficult and so crazy. And then coming to California, I'm living in New York. This is 1989. I got cast in the movie, come out in 1990. Uh, it just so happened that my uh, my ex-wife moved to Florida with my kids. I mean, she, you know, it was all... She, we went through the motions. She made the kids talk to me about it. She didn't do anything underhanded. She just, you That's know. That's good. And so the kids wanted to go to Florida. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go. I did Law of an Order. I did uh, the shows in New York. I said, let me get on a plane and go to California. I had an agent out here that was definitely interested in representing me if I could get here. And what happened was... I left New York and I came here in uh, February of 1991. I drove across the country and the agent called me. I told him where I was at. He sent me out on an audition. I didn't even know how, where Hollywood <laughs> Boulevard was. And I get the job, uh, uh, an episode of Hunter, guest star. I get the job. I didn't even meet the agent yet. I get the job. Huh. So uh, California was... Um, Great for me. I mean, all I did was work, 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 guest star here, guest star there, movie here, movie there, honeymoon in Vegas. Uh, and um, before I left New York, I had also done A State of Grace at the same time as Goodfellas. That was, I got cast by Bonnie Timmerman at a Rayo's. She says, Johnny, come down to my office. She says, uh, I may have something for you because uh, Phil Giovanna was is letting me cast this scene you know, the characters in the scene. So I went down and she you're perfect. And I got that job. So I was doing two feature films, one for Orion, one for Warner Brothers, without ever having a resume. I mean, I mean, I mean, it's kind of like, well, how how did this happen? You know. Uh, but you know, you you put it out there though. You know, the universe yeah, brings yeah. things together. You know, um, I love the stories about Rayos because I remember when I was 20 years old, uh Bo Deal, you know Bo. Yeah. He said, come on, we're going to go to Rayo's. You bite to eat. The one there, Frankie was behind the bar. Yeah. And I meet him, nice guy. And then there was a bunch of other guys, nice Italian-looking guys. So they all sit down. 
and the one seat, the door is right there. Right. So I, I go, um, Bo, he goes, Mike, sit down. I said, Bo, my father said, never sit with your door, your back to the door. He goes, you feel uncomfortable? He goes, wait a minute. So he reaches down, he takes his 38 from his ankle holster. He goes, here, put it in your pants. Feel better now? So Frankie's just shaking his laughing. So I'm sitting now with a loaded 38 in my waistband at 20 years old. I barely knew Bo. And I'm sitting there going, what the fuck yeah. am I, you know? But I got to tell you something. So then when they order the food, Frank goes, what do you want? I go, um, can I get um, grilled chicken breast, no skin, and steamed broccoli? Frankie turns to Bo, is he, is he, is he joking? Mm. Why would you want to take the skin off? It tastes like shit. Yeah. So I said, no, no. he goes, ah, he's just bodybuilding. He just, he goes, all right, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to make the chef do it, but you better eat all the fucking food in that dish. Okay. So as a joke, they went back and they brought the food out. I swear to God, he, he must have brought me like five pounds of chicken breast and broccoli. He said, kid, you ain't leaving this place to eat the food. Wow. Of course, I ate it like a Gavone. I ate it. It was the funniest time. But then I go there once in a while with Bo and see Frankie, and they'll never forget that story they did with me. But I got to tell you something. There's something magical about Rails. Oh, the yeah. The one in Harlem. Oh, absolutely. You know? And you're right. You being in there, that energy, the people, yep. the history. How many years has Rails been in there? Uh, 127. 1896. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So would you say the Goodfellas was their springboard of your- Oh, 100%. 100%. Wow. If the movie wasn't what it was, chances are I would have never pursued this business the way I did. Um, you know, Goodfellas was the catalyst of all catalysts. I mean, uh, and, you know, uh, the scene that, um, that I had and the death scene are two iconic scenes in, in movie history. Uh, the way Scorsese set up the death scene with my wife and I in the Cadillac and Layla playing and the kids finding the car and the, the whole camera shot of one scoop seeing the blood. And it, I mean, it was, it was gory yet simpatico at the same time. I mean, only guy like Marty could do that. I mean, he's got that, he's got that vision. What was it like working with you? Yeah, it was great. It was great. I mean, he, <laughs> he gave me one direction. He says, listen, he says, uh, he pu pulled me in his trailer, him and I, and he says, listen, he says, Johnny, I know you're from Harlem, and I know you your reputation. He says, and I know you're, you're pretty tough. He said, but this guy, De Niro's character, he says, this guy, Jimmy, he killed at least 30 guys and you know it. So you know you're dealing with you're dealing with a psychopath. I wanna see that. I said, that was his direction. And then De Niro, uh, very generous actor, very uh, talented, beyond talent and generous. He said to me, he says, Johnny, you know, we were talking at the bar. I set him up, I set him up like Abbott and Costello. I did the slowly I turned routine on him and I caught him. I caught him dead. And uh -huh. he, you know, and he and, and that broke the ice. And uh he said, he says, Johnny, do me a favor. He says, anywhere in the scene, you want to do it, just tell me not to get excited. And I said, tell you not to get excited. He says, yeah. That was it. So in the scene, as he's yelling at me, his professionalism, knowing what he's seeing, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just there. Sure. And he would turn away. When he would turn away, where's the camera going to go? On me. So he knew what he was doing, and he knew what he was seeing. Yep. I was just reacting, you know. Sure. And uh, when I told him, uh, what are you getting excited about, Jimmy? Oh, that was, that was his fuse. That's what he wanted. Uh, That's when he goes, he rips me an asshole. What's the matter with you? I told you not to buy anything. And you're going out, and the feds that are was, watching. Oh, that's fucking sick. Yeah. And, wow. and, and and I stay in, I'm going, I don't know, I don't, I don't know what you get excited about, you know, w which made it even more, is it's almost like a father yelling at a kid and the kid's not paying attention. Yeah. So that all worked for me um, immensely. Like, you know, 
I'm in show business. I'm an actor. I'm a recognized actor. I'm, I'm credited with a lot of stuff, and people recognize me. People want to work with me. It's it, it's great. And then I started writing. I would have never. I don't think I would have ever started writing unless I was in this business that gave me that avenue to look at that uh, another medium. So I'm writing now. I'm writing. Uh, Kind of like an autobiographical story about me. Not that I, I'm a, I, I, I found the cure for cancer, but when I look back on stuff that you know, I came close to having problems, major problems, on the street, and then seeing that I made it here this far, yeah, um, I have to write it. Uh, listen, your your journey's amazing, man. Yeah. From being this street guy, running a deli, fed up, your marriage ends, right? And then all of a sudden, you're like, "What? What am I gonna do?" Yeah, right. Yeah, and you go to that seminar. You spend money you probably couldn't afford, but you knew it's something you should do. Exactly. Gut feeling, right? Exactly. And then all of a sudden, you get this break. Yeah. I mean, wow. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. That that's some book, and I'm here um, since ninety one, thirty three years, and um, the circle in the in the writing in the book is Rayo's in New York and Rayo's in Hollywood. I mean, it's phenomenal how I ended up home. Yeah, again, you know. But you know, I love going to Rayo's, but when you're not there, it's not the same. Well, I represent, you know, you you you, you bring that authenticism to it. Yes, and when you're there and you smile, how you doing? You, you, and the jokes and the big smile and this powerful energy you have when you walk up to the table. Yeah, I watch when you go over to every table, and they everybody lights up when you come to the yeah. table. Yeah, well, but the talent there is that again. I go back to what I originally told you when I sat down here. I lived a pretty long life. I'm living a pretty long life, and I have a tremendous memory. And I and I could relate to almost anything, anywhere I've been with anybody that comes in. They could be total strangers. Then all of a sudden, you get that one thread, and bango, and you're talking. I got people from Australia. I spent a month and a half in Australia. I got friends down in Australia nice. and uh, in Melbourne, and, right? And, and people that come from New York, forget it. They go, they go nuts. People from Jersey, Long Island, they come to L.A. and then they find a guy like me, and they could relate to. They could relate. There's always something relatable about that. So when I go over to the different tables, I'm like dancing to different music. Sure. And I'm home. I mean, I couldn't do it if I wasn't comfortable. If I wasn't comfortable walking around a restaurant and being who I am, uh, uh, aside from show business, this is, I'm the Rayos guy. I forget yeah. the show business. When they recognize me from movies, that's fine. Better yet, yeah. take a picture, fine. But the thing is, I relate to them. I relate to them sitting there. They feel, they feel magical. They feel special. And it isn't fake. It's like, you know, oh, where are you from? Dick Sills, Long Island? Oh, yeah. They got the restaurant. Oh, yeah, you know the guy. Yeah. But... yeah and nice. there's always some a thread. There's always a common thread that you could relate to that makes the people feel at home. They can let their head down. They feel like they're comfortable. And a lot of times uh, what I see in the business today is that these consortiums get together, these restaurant groups, they go for $12, $15 million, and they think they make this elaborate place that has this gorgeous setting. And they think that's the job. That's part of it. You have to have hospitality. You got to have warmth. You got to bring people in. But, but I remember, never forget you said they serve peasant food. What was it? How did you word it to me? Yeah, it's peasant food. It's exactly who we are. We're a red sauce joint, but you got to have the best ingredients doing the peasant food. That's what you at need affordable to do. prices too. Yeah, well, we give you a nice, we give you a nice sure. uh, portions, and you know, you know, we're not the foo foo fee fee restaurant that's going to give you the truffle and ninety five dollars for a dish of macaroni because that's not us. Our focus is on good peasant food with high quality. That's now, uh, is it true that I guess the owners want to build it into a franchise now? Uh, it, 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 it seems that way because there's a lot of people interested in the name, you know, uh, now that they had the food business and they're all over the, the world with uh, the last deal that they made with Campbell's Soup that bought out Sovo Foods, which represented, uh, they had about 20 brands and Rayo's was their number one brand. So 
Yeah, that that that's just the natural progression of things uh, to have people want to look at what will pay for the name, and and so it's a delicate um, it's a delicate operation to have someone use your name um, and go for all of the risk and money, and then you need to keep the control of the quality. That's the essential thing. Uh, yeah, because I was concerned because I, I remember. Um, a couple times, um, I forget the guy that used to manage the place. He left, um, but he was telling me that uh, they had thought about maybe doing one in West Hollywood or Beverly Hills or yeah. Malibu, and then they Nick Stad said, "Nah, we'll just maybe do a franchise, or whatever." Yeah. But I was like, if you do that, I hope it doesn't lose that magic. Yeah. But the thing that that all that all came about when um, the Hollywood. Um, the Hollywood restaurant, um, they they bought bought out the lease because they're going to knock down that whole corner. Uh, so there was volatility there. Now since that since that happened, the developers have ran into some kind of delay. So we're there, even though they bought our lease, we're protected. They gave us new lease for we're how long? Protected. Well, another year and a half or so. Uh, but I mean, we're protected. But the thing is. That's why there was talk of Malibu. There was talk of West Hollywood. Oh, okay. It was to replace the LA representation in Hollywood. So now that that's not that that we're still there, um, the, the other locations are kind of like on a back burner. I think the Malibu one is for sure that's dead. But um, they'll see what they want to do. I mean, they're yeah. really in a catbird seat in the sense that they don't need to have representation in LA. They don't need to have a restaurant. You know they don't. Yeah, that's but true. the thing is, be nice though. It's nice. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. I'd hate to see it go, man. Yeah, we created something real. It's real, magical, man. Yeah, it's really good, really good. Um, and you know, I, 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 you know, it's above my pay grade. They don't sit me at the table because, uh, to be honest, <laughs> I'm affiliated with the brand much longer than they are, uh, fifty four years, and and you know, it's kind of like, <laughs> you know. I know where it came from, yeah. you know. Now, I know you say you you have your own recipes. So, do you have a a recipe comparable to the Rails meatball? No, the Rails meatball. That recipe is you say spot on. You'd say it was one of the on. best. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Because I, I, I guess what do they do? The pork, the veal, the yeah. beef. Right. Is that what they do? Is that blend that really makes it right? The tr yeah, the tr uh, you know, the holy trinity. Yeah, I mean, that's the first thing I want is yeah. the meatballs. As soon as the waiter comes, bring the meatballs. Yeah, right. And then we can yeah. figure out the rest yeah. of the food and the cheese. The, you know, and yeah, it's it's a it's a great recipe. It's in the book. I mean, it's not a secret. It's in the book. Anybody could do it. Now, are you gonna maybe someday open a restaurant of your own? No, I got I had opportunities. I, I I'm way past that i don't have the energy for it i really don't yeah it's a lot of work huh? it's a lot of work and dealing with the state dealing with people dealing with people to work for you the hard part is not the customers the hard part is the people that work for you yeah. <laughs> believe it or not a lot of stealing no it's not even that it's that it's that the way um the environment um is so against ownership and um it's you know it's just the pendulum is too far the other way and in order to get a point across on how you want to make your presentation you get people that if they don't want to listen there's nothing you could do about it you know I, I, my family had a, a restaurant in new york in brackliff matter called uh, torches ristorante yeah so when I was about uh, 19 years old, my uncle goes, Mike, I got a job for you. You want to be a night manager at my restaurant? I said, sure. He goes, just hang around, make sure everything's going okay. Maybe get cases you know, for the bartender or a side of beef for the chef if he needs it in the kitchen. you know. So I'm watching it. And then he goes, oh, so listen, I after you lock up, just stick around, sit in the park left about a half hour. I'll pay for the time. I said, okay. I had no idea what he wanted me to do. He said, what? Just watch. So I see the bartender um, leaving, and he had uh, two cases of wine. 
puts in the cars. Okay. He said, don't just look, don't say anything if you see something. And then the chef, uh, a few nights later, he's he takes a half a side of beef out of the walking freezer. And he's put it in his, he had it wrapped up, wow. put it in a trunk. So he said, at the end of the week, he says, what'd you see? I said, I seen Larry, we have two cases and uh and uh, Victorio, he uh, took a side of beef. Okay. And he went right in and he fired him. Mm -hmm. He said, Mike, you know, he's fucking people stealing from me. Yeah. Uh, shortly after he sold the restaurant, he goes, you know, yeah. I don't want to deal with this shit. I was so good to these people. I know. And they gave me. Doesn't said, matter. You know what? If he was, if he needed that the, the beef, I would have given him the beef. I know. Right? Human, if you had a problem. Na human nature is human nature. See, today, that that's kind of cut down drastically because all the cameras that are around, yeah. so you, you don't have that. But you, you, but what you have is you have the attitude that you can't tell them what to do. You can't. You can't. You, you, you know they sue you. Uh, right. Yeah. Discrimination. Sexual, yeah. Sexual harassment. Uh, uh, a volatile uh, environment. Uh, unfriendly. This that. How do you prove that? So your lawyer says, look. He said it's going to cost you ten to fifteen thousand dollars in legal fees. Give them the five thousand and chase them. Uh, that's what happens, and that's what you're at. That's where you're at today. There's no winning. Uh, yeah, it sounds like a real headache to no, me. There's no winning. So what's what's the next with you? Is, is it a movie? Is your own TV series? What do you well, want? Well, no. What I'm doing now is uh, uh, I'm writing the book. Um, the name of the book is. Um, Hell's Gate Station, 10029, which is the zip code for East Harlem, to Beverly Hills, 90210, The Journey. Wow. Uh, it's the same number as Juxtapose. It's great. It's Fantastic. A good, it's a good hook. How far ahead are you? Uh, I'm on book? chapter one. Uh, you know, it's going to take a while, but it's fine. I'm not writing Pablum. I'm writing really good stuff. And, uh, you know, I have, I'll get some help. Uh, I, I I gave a good friend of mine who's a published novelist. I sent him some money, so he's on the back burner oh, and, okay. and he's waiting to help me. You know, he sure. I haven't sent him anything that I've written yet, but um, I did send him like a little intro, and he he was impressed with the intro. He says, "You know what? You, you know." And then uh, I, I, you know, it's funny. I don't go to psychics. Uh, whether I believe them or not is not is irrelevant. I don't go, but I had a situation where a psychic sent to a friend of mine a message without knowing me, without knowing who I am, without knowing what I do, huh. said that there's two women and my brother who just passed away in October. Oh, so, so. sent them sent them a message. Yes. I must write this book and get whatever help I need. I must write this book. The woman didn't even know I, I wrote a book. The woman didn't even know I was a writer. Oh, no, no. But true, uh, true. Sure. A woman in the restaurant was getting her nails done. This woman does nails and she's a psychic. And I happened to send her a text of a reservation. And she said, that guy never read the reservation. So she says, Whoever sent you that text, she said, oh my God. So she says, what? Yeah, he, he's, you know. He helps me in the restaurant. She says, forget it. This guy is like, you know, and she went on and on and on. Hmm. And she says, you got to send him a message. You got to send him a message. Wow. John, it's amazing. I can't, <laughs> I can't wait to read the, to read the yeah, book, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, That's great. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Y you know, and, uh, and the wise we guys on the street and, and the street, you know, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I was on the fringe of a lot, a lot of stuff, and um, my character got me through everything. I mean, I, I'm such a ball breaker uh, in <laughs> in an environment that could be, let's say, dangerous. But I always true to myself, and somebody up there is watching me. I I I, I got out of a lot of situations with humor. <laughs> But, but so, would you say that it's not too far of a stretch of your character to your real personality? No, it's not. It's basically you it's just not, human being, yeah. being yourself. Yeah, I look at I look at life. Look, I look at life 
in in a, in a very optimistic and funny way. You know, I, I look at the funny side of everything. I could like a, a, I wrote seven scripts. I could write a script that starts out with a five year old with cancer, terminal cancer, and by page seven, it's a comedy uh, because of the way I look at life. Sure, and that's the way I was all my life from grammar school. That's why when the kids they say, "We're not surprised. We're not surprised." Well, you're, uh, you're in the movies. Yeah, we're not surprised. We're not surprised. Hey, well, I want to thank you for today. This is so beautiful, man. Good yeah, it's you. great. It's great. I, I mean, I talk about myself. You know, like I said, I, I didn't find a cure for cancer, but I think that people um, will read the book and find the entertainment value and some poignant stuff about how you look at yourself in life at certain situations. You get to a point. I mean, I, I could have been... Oof, 16 years old, I could have went in a whole different direction, but I kind of, I kind of was self-aware that it wasn't for me, that that life wasn't for me. But I, I love the fact that you embrace yourself, that you don't have this lean, ripped up body. You accept the way nah. your genetics <laughs> are. You love the way you feel. Yeah. You live your life. Yeah. You don't have to do anything to impress anybody. No. This is who, who I am. No. Take it or leave it, right? Yep. Speak from the and heart. And it's guided you through your journey here. And look how, how, how many people, everybody adores you. Anyone anyway, mention your name? Oh my God, I love him. Oh, he's so funny. Yeah. He's the best. Seriously. Yeah. You light up the room when you walk in the room. Yeah, thank you. But you speak from your heart and, and you could connect. And, uh, you know, people with uh, a high command of the English language and sometimes you're yawning after three minutes or listening to them. But, you know, me, I come over with the, the this, that, and the other thing, and before you know it, they're laughing, they're, they're relating. So it's it's a matter of being human. It's a matter of being human no matter where you're from, yeah. no matter what you've done in your life. If you're human and you connect to that human part of someone else in a room, it could be Yankee Stadium, it could be one-on-one, -on -one. It, it's all the same. You yeah. gotta touch, you gotta have that human touch. And today, it's 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 getting rarer and rarer with the phone, and the technology and, and everything else, the direction is going kind of like in an opposite direction. Yeah, that's why, you know, that people love the text. After a while, I go, listen, my fingers are getting tired. Pick up the phone. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I, I like human interaction. Texting is okay, running late or something. Yeah. But pick up the phone if you've got something to say. Yeah. Don't be like, give me some information, all this stuff. And, you know, especially women, they like to do this texting. Yeah. It drives me crazy. Yeah. Yeah. But um yeah. but thank you for today. Everybody, I just want to thank Johnny again. I mean, he is I mean, an amazing ball of energy. Well, you gotta go see him at Rails in Hollywood and look out for his book. Thank so you. this is Mike Torsha signing off from Live Well and Thrive. And please subscribe. We need your support. Thank you.